Well, thank you, Mr. Toms, for the words of welcome. I think I repeat myself every time I come here in responding to the words of welcome by saying that I so much enjoy gathering with you. I have to say that I look on the little gathering here as something that I believe heaven must look down upon with joy and love. It is our privilege in this great city to uphold some very ancient truths. Ancient truths that are greatly neglected in many places and worse than that are despised in many, many other places. And that is sad. But we want to honour God tonight and say very clearly by preaching the doctrines for which our testimony is named, preaching the doctrines that we believe God will remain faithful to, no matter what men may say or how they may cast doubts upon the fulfilling of prophecy in its simple and plain way, we uphold those truths and testify that we believe it shall be so, even as God has said it. So it's a joy for me to be here, and I can only say that I find it a double honor in taking the place of Dr. Brian Green, who was the scheduled speaker on this occasion. But as we all know, very suddenly the Lord took him home. As an Ulster man, I cannot but note the strange providence that he should die in Ulster. Ulster was a special place for Brian Green. It's a long time ago he became associated with the Free Presbyterian Witness. In fact, he was sent over to investigate claims by some that the Free Presbyterian Church was not at all what it was being made out to be by Ian Paisley and his supporters. And Brian Green was sent over from London, uh, from, I believe, the British Council of Christian Churches, to see if there was a free Presbyterian church to the degree and to the strength that there were those who claimed. And from that sprung many friendships. This year we mark the 50th anniversary of the beginning of the gospel work and witness of the Free Church down in our part of the world, that's out in the west of Ulster, because it was in 1967, February 1967, that the very first meeting, first regular Free Presbyterian meeting, took place. And it was shortly after that when I, as a, a student minister, being in charge of that fledgling work, invited Brian Green to come and speak at an annual meeting. Now, I can't be just precise on which year it was. I'd be inclined to think it was our very first annual meeting. Now, <clears throat> let me tell you just as a little indication of how God was working back then. The very first public meeting was held on Saturday the 11th of February. Just a little announcement in the newspaper that a free Presbyterian witness and meeting was going to take place on that Saturday afternoon and again in the evening. The place was filled on both occasions. The next Lord's Day as a result of the interest shown on the Saturday, 
The next Lord's Day was announced as the first Free Presbyterian Sabbath service. It was held at 3.30. So that was the 12th of February. By the 2nd of April, the work of constitution took place. A congregation had gathered, people had petitioned the presbytery, signed a letter requesting to be recognized as a congregation, and seven weeks after the very first meeting, the new congregation was constituted. God was working then. And I believe that it was at the first annual meeting of that new congregation that Brian Green was invited to speak. Now, if it wasn't that, it was the second one. And I recall introducing him in the gathering, not that he would have been a stranger, but to many people down that part of the world, he would have not been well known. He was known throughout the Free Church, but this was a, a new church a new congregation made up of people who were only coming into the Free Presbyterian Church. So we introduced them. And I've got to say that I, without thinking or rehearsing or planning, I said to the people in the, the meeting, look, if there's anyone here who, as a result of coming to the meetings that have only begun maybe 12 months, and have been converted or have been restored from a backslidden position or have in any way been blessed of God and their lives changed, would you please just put your hand up? And I've got to say, I was somewhat astounded and very happy to see a forest of hands going up. And I recall Brian Green saying, this is, this is revival, that this should have happened in short, such a short time. This is revival. And I've often thought back to that time and recognized that he as an outsider was able to more quickly see and evaluate what was taking place than the likes of me who was in the middle of all that was going on and just not as aware of, of the wonderful things that were taking place, being swept along by it as all, all. And Brian, as a stranger coming in and seeing that, he was very struck by it. And on many occasions subsequent to that, when we met, he used to refer back to that encounter. So, to take his place here tonight, I, I count it a privilege, and I do hope to be able to attend his funeral on Tuesday, and to pay my respects. I think all of us realize that when someone like him is taken away from a nation, then the nation is the poorer. And England is very much the poorer of yet another voice being silenced. And we should take note of that. I tell you, we should take note of that. What it is the Lord is doing. I was very conscious as I came to London at recent events. And I think that as a, an Ulster man, I would, I would like to just put on record my condolences and sympathy with those who suffered at the hands of that madman in Westminster, particularly the policeman's family, and of course the others, uh, the details of which I am not quite so familiar with, but they're young people, I understand, and there's an American man, and there are others who remain grievously injured. And we do remember them. And pray God in his mercy would draw near. 
And out of this tragedy there may come an awareness of the need of salvation. But I've got to make a comment or two. I wouldn't be an Ulster man if I didn't. About the politics of it all. Did you notice that on Tuesday your Prime Minister stood up in the House of Commons and eulogised Martin McGuinness? Oh, she made some comments about what he had been and all the rest of it, but uh, she couldn't very well speak of him without speaking of his many decades of terrorism. But she chiefly extolled his so-called statesmanship and his labours as a peacemaker. God help England if they think Martin McGuinness is a peacemaker. The next day, she had a tragedy to speak of, a terrorist act on her own doorstep from which the news services now have a video of her scurrying out of the House of Commons and into her armoured car. Don't you think there's something significant in that? I do. You cannot speak well of those who are evil to the core and expect God not to judge it. I have been deeply grieved at the torrent of abuse and criticism that is issued forth against the Muslim terrorist who of course is guilty of horrendous crimes but at the same time his crimes are nothing in comparison to what Martin McGuinness and his companions have been guilty of and that for some 30-40 years and yet those who heaped abuse upon the singular Muslim were but a short time before waxing eloquent in their praise of Martin McGuinness. It is an offence to God. There were many people offended. The newspapers have some letters in their columns that indicate that the ordinary man and woman in the street is offended, and I, I, I was pleased to read some of those. But if, if ordinary men and women are offended, how much more is not the God of heaven offended? And we need to take note of the offence and the evidence of the offence that God has taken. 